God, a mighty God, we serve. What a mighty God, we serve. The angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God, we serve. Now, I know I can't sing to save my life, but I woke up this morning with the song in my heart that the God that we serve is a mighty, incredible God. It occurred to me that he doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need us to sing for him. Literally all of creation, the heavens are worshiping him day in, day out. All of creation is ready at any moment to lift up such a loud worship to him day in and day out. He doesn't stop existing because we worship him, but we begin to grow in strength when we come before him and we worship him. And this morning it occurred to me to just remember that the opportunity to worship God is a blessing. It's 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 a gift. It is something that we should not be taking for granted. It is something that we ought to be appreciating as children of God. Church, good morning. Indeed, a mighty God we serve. We are in October now. We're coming to the end of the year. And we're coming to the end of our second year of a pandemic and lockdown and all of that. And he has kept us. He has sustained us. Even until this moment, you and I are able to have this time right now because of his grace, because of his kindness, because of his mercy, because of his goodness. What a mighty God we serve. This morning, church, I'd like us to just get right into the word that I want to share. There's a lot that I want to unpack and uh, I'm praying that the Lord will help me <laughs> to, to, to go with it. Uh, in a linear way. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, and we're going to read chapter 11. Now, church, there are quite a few verses that we're going to read. So I actually had to cut down to make sure that because we're going to read such uh, chunks of scripture that I don't throw in as many additional scriptures as, as I would normally throw in. So let's just get into the word. Uh, John chapter 11, we're going to read verses 1 through to 45. Bear with me and please read it in your Bible if you can. If your Bible is not around you, grab it, send someone to bring it for you, but have it close to you and let's read it together, church. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you are going back. Jesus answered, there are not, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So when he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, 
said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Church, this is the key thing I want to speak about today. Martha's words, and later on we read Mary's words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How often do we look at circumstances and situations and things that we're facing and dealing with and go, Lord, if you had just, if only you had. I can only imagine the disappointment. I can imagine the pain that Mary and Martha would have experienced knowing that, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had, I would not be facing this situation. I would not be in this circumstance. And sometimes as Christians, we perhaps don't want to speak about it. But the title of my message today is, when Jesus failed. Because sometimes, even though we don't want to speak about it, we have this thinking and this feeling that, Lord, though you have failed me, Lord, you haven't come across for me, you haven't pulled through for me, you haven't stood out for me, you haven't fought for me. You know, there's a meme that was doing the rounds recently that said, why does it look like the weapons formed against me are prospering? And, and, and sometimes in, in the back of our minds, this thought begins to build up that Jesus, but you're failing. Jesus, you have failed me. I am stuck in this situation and in this circumstance because you who is able to do so much has not done anything for me. So I want us to unpack these two, situ there are two situations that I think in the Bible people were looking at and seeing Jesus in a state of failure. And I want us to unpack them so that we can see something about how God moves and works and we can see something that I hope would be an encouragement to us. Because in this year, this has been the year where the Lord has said, restored and firmly set. And perhaps for some of us, we might not be feeling restored and firmly set. Perhaps for some of us, we might be looking around and not seeing ourselves being restored and firmly set. Come with me on a journey. Let's quickly look at these portions of scriptures and look at certain things. John chapter 11, in verse 1, when John is writing, he starts off with, now a man named Lazarus was sick. These words stood out for me because everything else that we talk about, sometimes we forget that we are talking about real people. We are dealing with men and women who lived lives that were some in so many ways similar to the lives that we are living. They faced disappointment. They faced sickness. They faced death. They faced insurmountable challenges and incredible challenges. And when we read in the book of Hebrews, uh, the writer speaks of them as being the heroes of faith. We call them heroes because something stood out about how they lived. Something stood out about how they walked. And sometimes we're so focused on that hero element that we neglect and we forget that a man named Lazarus, just simple people who were living lives that are hardly any much different from what we're experiencing. David was a man. Peter was a man. Paul was a man. Moses was a man. These people were men, men and women who were living. I mean, I didn't mention more Deborah. I didn't mention more Ruth. I didn't mention more Naomi. These were people who were people. And yet out of their lives, we draw something of the greatness of God. And I just want to say that our, our, 
lives as they are, our experiences as they are, are not necessarily devoid of God. They're not devoid of the work of God. I imagine that if you had called these people and you had said to them, you guys were heroes, you guys were incredible, you guys were wonderful, they would have probably said, we were just like everyone else. So when John starts writing here, he says, a man named Lazarus, a man, just a normal man named Lazarus. He was sick. And when he was sick, this Lazarus, we learn something wonderful about him, that he and his sisters were close to Jesus. They were within the life of knowing Jesus. Even better, I want you to hear what the sisters say to Jesus when they send a message to Jesus. The, the message that they send to Jesus in verse 3 says, So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. This is, this is someone that they're acknowledging, Jesus, you have loved us. Jesus, you love us. I love that there is this recognition of the love of God. And how often do we sit in positions where we are so confident of the love of God that we would send messages to Jesus and say, Lord, the one you love is sick. There was this acknowledgement that actually this Jesus loves us. This Jesus has loved us. And it's this Jesus that they, they are writing to, that they are sending word to, to say, Lord, we're moving from a place of acknowledging that you love us. We're moving from a place of acknowledging Acknowledging that you have care for us and we are appealing to you because of your love. Their message doesn't ask for anything much more. They're saying the one you love is sick because they're trusting that his love is going to move him. They're trusting that he's going to move because he is touched and moved because he carries love for Lazarus. They're not calling out to Jesus from a place of, Jesus, remember I washed your feet. Remember, Jesus, that time when we did that for you, now we need you to do this for us. No, no, no. They're appealing to his love and they're reaching out to him because of his love. They're acknowledging that the greatest thing in this relationship, Jesus, is your love. I look at them and I see them so much as you and I, who are men and women who have acknowledged the love of God, who have seen the love of God. And sometimes we come to Jesus and we appeal to him and we reach out to him and we say, Lord, you have said you love me because of your love, because of your great love, Jesus, move on our behalf. And you know what? This great love is also something that stands out when John writes later on in verse 6. When Jesus receives word of this, what does Jesus say? He says, the Bible says, I'm going to read from verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, you have to understand who's writing here. This is John who called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this very same John is acknowledging that Jesus also loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So this is just an overflow of acknowledgement of the love that exists in this relationship. So in verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Mary, and loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. In verse 6, he says, So as a result of, because of this love, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. An incredible contrast to what we might consider to be a response of love. He stayed where he was two more days. His motivation for his action is love. The reason he stays where he is for two more days is because of love. It's because of his love. And sometimes we misunderstand the love that is around us, the love that we're experiencing from God. We misunderstand it because we want to interpret, we want to experience his love in our way. We want to experience it in the way that we think is right. But the writer here says, so when he heard 
he stayed two more days. When I think about it here, it's easy for John to write these things because John was exactly in the presence of Jesus. John was exactly where Jesus was. So John was able to see that Jesus loved them. John was able to see the love of Christ in the midst of the situation. But it occurs to me that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were far away. They were not in the place that Jesus was at. And sometimes when we're in a place where our circumstance and our situation seems to have pulled us so far away from Jesus, when we are in a situation where we're busy trying to nurse back into health, dying situations and dying relationships and dying scenarios and dying things in our lives, when we're busy, so focused on those, we're so far away that we we are not able to acknowledge so easily the love of God. We go to church and you hear about how Jesus has loved me so and you struggle to even lift up your hands and sing that song because you are facing your dying situation and you are facing your dying you know, relationship and you are facing your dying workplace and you are facing these things that are dying in your life and it becomes difficult in that situation to be able to acknowledge, to see the love of God unfolding before your eyes. You're struggling to see it. And there are those who are standing near Jesus. There are those who are in their moment of being high up on the mountain. There are those who are experiencing the presence of God and they walk up to you and they say, Jesus loves you. And you tell them about your situation and your circumstance and they say, Jesus loves you. Because at that moment, they are standing deep in the presence of God and they're able to experience and see how much the Lord loves you. And I want to bring that to us. You know, sometimes we hear that, you know, in the midst of my difficulty, I'm not looking to hear from you that Jesus loves me because I'm not experiencing or feeling his love. But I want to show you the contrast here, that there are the Johns who are in the presence of Jesus, who are sitting with Jesus. And because they're sitting with Jesus, they're able to see that this that you are seeing right now is a moment of his love. It's a moment of his care. And they speak to you the love of Jesus. And they speak to you about how much he cares for you. And you might not be seeing it, but because because they are seated in that place where they are deep in the presence right now, they are able to say, my brother, my sister, Jesus loves you. And I want to encourage you that don't be quick to dispense of the words of encouragement that come from people in the midst of your moment of nursing your Lazarus situation and nursing your Lazarus relationship and nursing your Lazarus employment and nursing your Lazarus home and nursing your... When you are in the midst of being a person who's nursing your Lazarus, sometimes we're not able to see the love. Sometimes we're not able to have the certainty of the love of God. John could write and say, because of his love. John had such an incredible revelation of the heart of Jesus. Now, Jesus, he responds by staying there two more days. I want us to briefly consider Mary and Martha, who sent messengers to Jesus. Say, hey, messengers, go tell Jesus here. That the one he loves is sick. Sometimes we are the messengers. <laughs> Sometimes we are the ones that have to pray for people and appeal to the Lord on behalf of their lives. And sometimes we see a response from God that seems so contrary to what we might have expected. Sometimes he doesn't seem to be responding in the way that we expected. But there's something that we have to carry here. It is the love that Jesus had in all of this. Imagine Mary and Martha who have just sent word that Jesus, the one you love, is sick. Imagine them receiving the response from, 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 from the messengers. Hey, when the messengers arrive, I bo guys, who put Jesus? 
we we sent you to go tell him how is he not here with you right now did did you guys tell him did he did he get the message how is it that you are arriving here empty handed without jesus how is it that you are arriving here without him i imagine mary and martha asking where is he and i imagine the messenger standing there having to give a response to a grief stricken people because sometimes we're praying for you and it's hard for us to stand there and not see the response and and just seeing your heartbreak and your disappointment when you see that you're not seeing the response that you're expecting that you're not seeing i imagine the messenger standing there saying hi hi we told him what you said but um he did not come with us as you can see he's not here with us i imagine them telling mary and martha that you know be encouraged though he did say that this situation would not end in death be encouraged because he said that this is not going to end in death the sickness will not end in death i imagine mary and martha hearing those words and maybe becoming a little bit encouraged the situation will not end in death they see a glimmer of hope just a, a slight light to say okay he's not here but he's he's at least sent a word how often have we received a word a word where the lord says i'm going to elevate you how many times did god tell abraham I'm going to make you the father of many. How many times did God say as numerous as the sand of the seashore? How many times did God say as numerous as the stars in the sky? How many times did God give that promise and that word and yet when Abraham died there was Isaac and Ishmael whom Abraham probably didn't even know where he was. Mary and Martha had a glimmer of hope they had some sort of encouragement this is my imagining that jesus said the situation would not end in death i imagine any one of them sitting on the bed with lazarus on their lap as they wipe the sweat off of his brow and and, and they try to cool him and they say be encouraged brother the lord has sent word the sickness will not end in death you will rise from where you are you're going to get up we're going to celebrate again hang in there hold on tight now imagine that disappointment imagine that disappointment on the day he breathes his last breath let's go back to jesus but rabbi they said jesus is now saying he's going back to judea Rabbi they said a short while ago the Jews they tried to stone you and yet you are going back ah <sighs> you know when i i read this i was like these guys are focused on the wrong thing they think that Jesus has stayed two days because of political motivation because he's somehow trying to preserve his own life we misunderstand sometimes god's intention we misunderstand when the lord speaks to us sometimes and you know as much as we try to encourage each other we sometimes give each other an encouragement that misunderstand jesus is not in the situation concerned about world politics he is not concerned about those who are wanting to kill him because we've already read that his motivation his purpose his drive has been a situation of love god is not concerned with the politics of living in 2021 he's not concerned with the pandemic he's not worried with your boss who is rude he's not concerned god is concerned with loving you he's concerned with your soul and they keep misunderstanding him because later on when jesus says this disciple has fallen asleep they misunderstand how do we listen to god when we hear from him how do we understand what he is saying 
Again, we are seeing a picture of how God speaks and we read ourselves into what the Lord is saying. We take what he is saying and make it into something that he possibly did not even mean for it to be. At this point, when Jesus says, Lazarus has fallen asleep, he's not speaking about sleep. He is speaking about death. He's not using the word death. I want you to see here that there are three things that Jesus is revealing. The first thing is he's revealing a spiritual truth. That death, as we know it, is not the full stop that we know it to be. That death is just a sleep. And that's why he says, I'm going to awake him. Because death is, is just a sleep. It's not the full stop. It's not the end that we make it out to be. We see it as this elevated, big, scary monster. There's a spiritual truth that Jesus is giving that this here is just sleep. It's something small in the eyes of a great God, in the eyes of a mighty God. The second thing that we see is that he's also speaking to a current situation. He's saying right now the situation looks like this. But the third thing that we see is that he's speaking to the future. Lazarus is asleep. I am going to wake him. But we get so bogged up in our own little details sometimes that we miss. That sometimes when God is speaking to you, he's revealing a spiritual truth to you. You had a dream where you were a strong and mighty warrior. He could have been revealing a spiritual truth to you. That even though now you are feeling weak, even though now you are feeling, you know, like you haven't the strength or the power, you are a strong and mighty person in the spirit. He's revealing a spiritual truth. Sometimes he's telling you about a current situation. He's giving you a revelation, an interpretation of what you might might not be seeing and you might not be seeing clearly and and sometimes he's just speaking to your future to say this is where i'm taking you this is where we're moving you to lazarus will rise again so i want us to come to a place of understanding that when the lord speaks and this is why god asks us for trust because sometimes when he speaks we we misunderstand him we misunderstand his intention like how the disciples thought he was being driven by political motive. Sometimes we see, you know, when our theme verse for this year says, after your brief suffering. Sometimes we see our brief suffering and we think that his intention in our brief suffering is to destroy us. And we think that his intention in our brief suffering is to punish us. And we think that his intention in our brief suffering is to break us down because we misunderstand and misinterpret his intention. The disciples thought that Jesus had stayed because he was worried about politics and he was worried about being stoned. But that was not his intention. And the second thing is sometimes we misunderstand he's speaking that when he speaks to us and he gives us an encouragement and he says, this is what will be. This is what I will do. This is how things are going to go. We look at those things and we misinterpret and misunderstand what he's saying to mean something that it doesn't. And we can end up feeling dejected and end up wanting to give up because we've lost sight of all of it. That's why God says, trust me. Have a little faith. Trust me, have a little faith. When we continue in the book of John chapter 11, and it seems I might not be able to go through everything that I want to go through. Jesus speaks to them plainly and says, Lazarus is dead. But he says, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there. He now reveals plainly to them. Number one, the purpose, it is for your sake. It is because I want to restore you. After your brief suffering, I will personally and powerfully bring restoration and set you firmly in place. After this difficulty, he's revealing the purpose. He's making it clear to them that, hey guys, there is something I'm working on right now. But secondly, he says, I am glad I was not there 
so that you may believe. I want you to believe. I want you to have faith. I want you to trust me. I've been asking for it. I'm going to show you why you should trust me. So now Jesus arrives. He gets to Mary and Martha. John chapter 11, when you continued from verse 22, the Bible says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. This is Martha speaking. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Verse 28 says, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. When he had said this, when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Then the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. I've skipped a few verses here, but I want to just quickly break out some things here as we continue with these scriptures. Jesus, he speaks to her and to Martha and he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, yes, I know he'll rise one day. There's a song that I like, quite enjoy it. It says, I came in this place all burdened down. Uh, mm. Now I lift my, what? Uh, I came in this place all burdened down. Uh, anyway, the song is about, I apologize, I can't remember the words now. But what, what this person, I think it's Tasha Cobbs says, she says, and, 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 and when she was burdened down and when she was struggling, she lifted her hands and, and, and she worshipped God and immediately God worked it out. And sometimes we, we expect God to do things after a long time. We expect them to be responses a long time from now. But sometimes God is busy doing something immediately. Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Mary uh, and Martha responds and says, I know one day, I know in the future. I know on that great day, on that wonderful day. But Jesus is not speaking about that wonderful day. He's speaking about this day. After your brief suffering, it, it, do you believe that God can do it now? Jesus says, I am this. And then Jesus says, I believe me when I say this. Do you believe me when I say all of this? And Martha says, yes, Lord. And then she goes on a tangent, I believe you are the Messiah. Church, I want to speak to us about how, you know, sometimes we might struggle to believe that God is able, even though we believe that God is there. There's this thing that I, I really hate that Kosa people often say when they speak about the devil, they say, you know, Satan, you know, the devil has power. 
and when they speak about god they say you know uh, god is there as if god just exists and doesn't do and isn't able to do here we see martha in a situation where she says i believe you are the messiah but do you believe that i can bring the dead to life do you believe that i can change and transform situations some of us we have come to a place where we believe that god exists but we might have lost our faith in god's ability that we might have lost our faith in god's intention that we might have lost our faith that god can do this and that he can do things now do you believe this? And I want you to interrogate yourself in whatever situation and circumstance you're in right now. Do you believe that God can do incredible things? Do you believe that God can bring restoration in that dead situation? That God can bring restoration in that place of death? Do you believe this? As we continue after she had said this, Martha goes and runs off to Mary and we hear these words again when Mary comes to the feet of Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We would not have experienced the pain that we're going through had you been here. If you had just been the Jesus that we expected you to be, if you had just done things the way that we had expected you to do them. But I want you to see something that I love about this portion of scripture is that Jesus does not immediately go to the house of Mary and Martha. Sometimes we are delayed because we ourselves do not go to Jesus. We, Jesus is standing there and he's waiting. He's waiting for them to come to him. He's waiting for them to come again and cry out to him because he wants them to be moved in the area of their faith. And sometimes we pray a little and we stop. Sometimes we give up too soon. Sometimes we quit when it's not yet time. I love that Mary got up and ran to where Jesus was. Even though when she gets to him, when she draws near to him, she comes and she says, if you had been there, Jesus, but you failed us. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus asks them to take him to the tomb of Lazarus. He gets to the tomb of Lazarus. And, and I want you to see and observe Jesus wept. That short verse speaks volumes. That though Jesus knew that the situation was going to change, though Jesus knew that the outcome was going to be different, though Jesus, but he was moved by their pain. And sometimes we think God has such a hardened heart towards us that he's not moved by our pain. And that's why he's not reacting. And that's why he's not responding. I want to encourage you and say to you, Jesus wept because it still mattered to him that these were in pain. These ones that he loved were in pain. God is moved by your pain. He's moved by your challenge and your difficulty. He cares enough. It bothers him enough that he will move on your behalf. So Jesus is weeping because the pain is getting to him. He is deeply moved by their pain. Not just their situation, but their pain. And we see here the response of some people who say, but if he had been here. Again, we are seeing people just looking at him and saying, you could have done better. But I want to bring you to where the situation all comes to an end. Jesus comes to the tomb. He says, roll the stone back. These are verses that I skipped. Please do read them. He says, roll the stone back. They say to him, no, we can't roll the stone back because... This guy's been dead for days. There's likely an odor now. There's a smell here. Jesus says, come on, guys. Can you trust me? Can you believe that I can do this? Can you believe that I can change the situation? Can you believe that I can do this? I'm asking you just to roll the stone back. Roll it back because I want to show you something. And when they roll the stone back, Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man comes out. Four days he's been in that tomb. Four days he's been dead. He comes out dressed in all the clothes from the grave. And Jesus says, remove the stones, the clothes from him that are the grave clothes from him. Remove them from him because he's no longer in a dead situation. 
And I want to speak to you and encourage you today. Sometimes we think Jesus has failed. Sometimes we see time rolling by. Sometimes we see situations unfolding in a way that seems opposite to what we... Jesus said the situation is not going to end in death. Jesus said he's going to do these incredible things. But I'm not, I'm not seeing. I'm seeing the opposite of it. And sometimes when we see that, we're quick to want to give up. We think this is game over. We think this is the end of the matter. I want to say to you that Jesus is able to call out and say, Lazarus, come out. In this, the year of being restored and firmly set. In this year where God is busy and, and has been busy on the project of restoration. I want to say maybe you haven't seen it the same way that others have, but Jesus has not failed because the, the situation has not ended. The circumstance has not ended. Where you are, things are not over yet. He's still busy. Will you allow him when he says, roll back the stone? Will you follow his instruction? Will you believe him when he says, do you believe? Will you trust his intention when he says, I love you? We quote scripture and we say, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. There are revealed two things. Number one, God's heart for you. And number two, God's work in your life. And I want to say God is working. He's busy. After your brief suffering, the God of all loving grace, he is personally and powerfully calling out the dead situations that need to come alive. He's fulfilling his promise, his word, where he said this situation will not end his, in death. He is fulfilling it, but do not give up. Draw back to him and trust him and, and, and show him so that he may reach into those places. Give him access so that he may reach into those places and bring restoration and being firmly set. Church, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that it is not all the time that we are able to just fully trust you. Sometimes, Jesus, it's very, very difficult. You know, like the disciples when they saw you hanging on the cross, Jesus, when they had buried you and they came to a place where after three years of trusting and hoping that something would change and that something would be different, they ended up facing a grave and a dead body. Father, sometimes we are facing graves and dead bodies and sometimes when we're kneeling at the feet of our circumstances and our situations, we really struggle to believe that they can be changed because we see them as full stops and we see them as the end of matters. So Lord, I'm asking that this morning help us your children, that we might continue to trust you, that we might continue to know that you are the God who does a good and great work, that you are the God who does a mighty work, that you are the God who calls the Lazarus back to life. We want to trust you in this year, Lord, you have said, restored and firmly set. We want to trust you that you have and will restore and set us firmly. So I pray, Father, that you will help us, your children, to hand over to you and to give you room and space to be God, that you'll help us to draw near to you, Lord, so that we might be able to let you do the work which you have promised to do in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you'll forgive us where we have stood in the way of what you are doing because we wanted a different outcome and expected a different outcome. I pray that you'll forgive us, Father. If you're at home and you need Jesus to come in to your Lazarus situation, if you are at home and actually you were in a period and a season where you had faith and you trusted that Jesus loved you and you had faith and you trusted that you would call out to him and, and you expected that he would respond and, and you felt maybe that he didn't respond. 
I want to invite you to pray right now and to just draw near to him. I want to invite you right now to send a message. Send a message to us and we'll pray with you. And I, I, Maybe you gave up. Maybe you walked away. Maybe you thought, you know what, this Jesus, he can't do this. Yeah, he exists and he's real, but he can't do this. I want you to draw near again to him. Because even if your situation is dead, he is able to resurrect what he wants to bring to life again. He's able to fulfill what he promised to do in your life. Don't give up on him. And if you want Jesus right now to come into your life, you want to know him, you want to move from a place of acknowledging his love, please message us. Get in touch with us and someone will get back to you and we'll be able to pray with you and we'll be able to give you direction about the next steps. Church, don't give up. If you watch Korean dramas and Korean movies, there's something they like to say there, fighting. Keep on fighting, keep on pushing on because God is able. What a mighty and incredible God we serve. God bless you. Go into a time of prayer now and just worshiping him. And don't let this day end with this video. Don't let your, your Sunday end with just this, but let it end with a moment in the presence of the Lord. God bless you and have a wonderful and exceptional week.